There comes a point in almost every YouTuber's career where they feel like they want to do more than just entertain small children through quick, attention-grabbing 10-minute videos, where they feel they can broaden their horizons and try something new by making a 90-minute movie for small children. I think it's safe to say that most YouTubers, not counting, I don't know, like Let's Players or Reaction Channels, have at least a small interest in video production, whether it be writing, directing, editing, etc. And when they eventually expand their audience wide enough, they decide they want to go the extra mile and let their creative juices flow by taking a stab at making a feature-length film. That or they just want money. Yeah, okay, I think it's safe to say that's the main reason for most. But anyway, there have actually been quite a few YouTubers who got this massive opportunity to have their work seen by more than just introverts who spend all their time on the internet. Finally, the general public will get the chance to further judge what we decide to watch. I mean, I'm trying to think of some YouTubers that actually went on to have success in writing and directing films. I mean... I guess there's David F. Sandberg if you want to count him as a YouTuber, considering he got to start uploading short horror films on the site. Uh, I'm sure there are more. Let me know in the comments if you can think of any. I want some kind of hope in this. So today I thought, why not look at every movie made primarily by YouTubers? Why not torture myself today? And thus I did a marathon on my Patreon Discord server. By the way, if you want to watch movies with me, link in the description. The films we watched were Fred the Movie, F the Prom, Smosh the Movie, Not Cool, a Sheen Dawson film, and Logan Paul's airplane mode. Are there more than that? Maybe. These were the ones I could find in my admittedly short research, but I can't bear to burr myself through more than five of these. Burr. I decided to exclude YouTube originals of those Channel Awesome films, because then we'd be here all day. For now, let's just focus on the widely released ones. So without further ado, let's jump right into our first film. Today's sponsor. Colon and bracket. No, 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 wait, make it a semicolon. Yeah. Redcon is a top-of-the-line earbud that you can afford for half the price of its competitors. I've been using them a lot recently. I've had wired earbuds for the longest time, and might I say the difference is night and day. Instead of constantly getting them stuck on stuff or having the wire break on me all the time, they fit nicely in my ear. Like, I forget I'm even wearing them half the time, they're that comfortable. I'm currently using the Everyday E25 model, which holds a charge of 6 hours. On top of that, the carrying case they come in can charge the earbuds 4 times in a single charge. They even pair up with any Bluetooth device I own, and are great for isolating noise. Get your model today in a variety of colors in the description below. If you click my link and go to buyrecon.com slash lsmark, you get 15% off and help support the channel. Thank you, Recon, for sponsoring this video. Fred the Movie was the first, and last, YouTuber movie widely released in cinemas. Great sign right off the bat. I know I already made a standalone video on Fred the Movie, so I won't spend terribly long on it here. You can go watch that for yourself if for some reason you want more content revolving around Fred the Movie. But I also think this could be a good opportunity to look back and reflect on my opinions back then. I was really positive towards this film. Some would argue too much. After watching it again, did I change my mind about this movie? Nope. For kids growing up nowadays, we must all look like dumb simpletons for letting Fred get as big as he is. Lucas Cruikshank was just a normal guy who started uploading short skits to YouTube in late 2005. He betrayed himself as a creepy, psychotic weirdo named Fred, who would speak with a sped up squeaky voice. Somehow this blew up and Lucas became the first ever YouTube channel to receive 1 million subscribers. Since the internet was still fairly new and bizarre to companies, they weren't really sure on how to capitalize off it at the time. So they just started throwing everything at Fred. They gave him three movies, two TV series, an entire episode dedicated to iCarly praising his mere existence. He was in Hannah Montana, the Teen Choice Awards. It's kind of inspiring how Lucas became a massive celebrity through nothing but his own... Well, I want to say talent. So yeah, in 2011, we got Fred the Movie, which premiered on Nickelodeon. In the US, that is. Over here in the UK, I was privileged with getting to witness this historic masterpiece on the big screen. And I loved it. I can say. This movie is about Fred, obviously. A friendless loser who doesn't really know he's a friendless loser. He has this creepy belief that he and the most popular girl at school, Judy, are actually together, and his countless imagination sequences acting out this fantasy of his. After finding out that Judy was kidnapped, and then later finding out she only really moved, Fred heads out on an adventure to get to her house, which is a whole one block away. This is such an inconsequential plot that I kind of love. The entire crux of it is that Fred is too dumb to know directions, and so sets out in this 90 minute adventure to find a girl who doesn't even really know he exists. They could have easily had this grand epic quest of Fred travelling through treacherous terrain to get to his fur maiden, but it knows what it is and keeps it simple. Maybe budget had something to do with that, but nevertheless I enjoy it quite a bit. Probably the most contentious point when talking about this movie is that 9 out of 10 people think Fred is annoying, and that other 1 out of the 10 are deaf. In the forward they are male. <gasps> 
I get it. You already moved? Where to? I don't know. They asked me to forward the mail. I... Why didn't you tell me? And I wrote the address. Mom, she's my girlfriend. Yeah, I'm gonna have to side with people that are Fred is really, really annoying. But like, that's the entire point of his character. It's hard to make a character like Fred likable. You know, he rides that dangerous line of being weird and quirky like Spongebob, or loud and obnoxious. Like Spongebob. I think the main thing to do when having a character like this that the Fred movie succeeds at, is having every single side character be completely and utterly fed up with his existence. Not even his own mother likes him. When you have a character the audience hates yet they always manage to come out on top and achieve their goals, it only makes the audience hate them more since it feels like they're being rewarded for their behaviour. But when the opposite happens and the character constantly gets crapped on for how they act, it only makes it all the more satisfying when they don't get what they want. Every time Fred gets even the slightest bit of confidence in this film, there's always something, no matter how minor, that brings him back to reality with his breaking point being when he finally gets to Judy's house only to realize she's having a party he wasn't invited to. Where at that point he completely loses it and starts running around his town handing out disinvitations to people letting him know that he's gonna have the epicest party that night and nobody's allowed to come. Oh! Oh, it looks like you got my message that you're not invited to my party! Sucker! And I gotta give Lucas some credit. He manages to hold my attention by himself for a whole movie. He's really given it his all. The voice can get grating considering they pitch shifted it for this film instead of speeding it up like in his old videos. But I kind of, like, don't care? I don't know, maybe it's just because I grew up with it, but I never really found his voice all that bad. And if you don't like Fred, this film has a bunch of aforementioned side characters we get to know. Each and every one of them have their own little quirks and gags revolving around them, and I love them all. Except for Pixie Lot, who clearly had no interest in this. Speaking of people who had no interest in this, it's clear at many points how self-aware the people behind this movie are about the fact that Fred is a bad character and is really annoying. There are countless jokes in this film referencing it, and even ones about how weird of a concept YouTube itself is. Really showing this was just made by a bunch of stuffy, stuck-up 40-year-olds who were like, What? Fred the movie? Ah, whatever, sure, I could use another boat. That's not to say that's all this movie has to offer in terms of jokes. A lot of it does rely on the simple concept of you thinking that screaming equals funny. But I... B but I think it's funny. And sometimes they do have a genuinely hilarious moment that catches me off guard. If I were to have one major complaint with the movie, it's that there are way too many pointless fantasy sequences. At some points, it works like when he reaches Judy's house and has this exaggerated act about how Fred thinks things will go down, to contrast with how she really feels about him when he really goes there. But there are way too many of these that are just Fred singing or Fred in army gear or his head falling off, and they're trying way too hard to be funny and random. But that complaint doesn't even come close to my biggest problem with the film. The last five minutes of this movie completely ruins every single thing it was building up to in the previous hour and 20. So Fred invites the one girl who was nice to him to his party, and they have a great time fabricating this elaborate get-up to trick the school into thinking they had a totes rad party. And suddenly everyone gets jealous and wants to be Fred's friend, then he gets the girl of his dreams despite her being shallow and only caring about him when he's popular? This was all perfectly setting up for Fred and Bertha to get together. And while nobody ends up falling for his party scheme, he ends the movie not caring and embracing his weirdness. Well, that or they could have went all out and made a Joker-style character study on this lonely, psychotic boy with an abusive mother, crazed fantasies of grandeur, and wanting revenge of the people who had wronged him. You know, just food for thought. Despite that, I still think Fred the movie is a pretty decent relic of its time. I'd never call it good per se, but I think for what it is, they did a pretty good job at translating Fred into an entertaining film. There's two other Fred movies, Night of the Living Fred and Camp Fred, but those are more like Nick original movies. I might just save them for a video all on their own if people want to see it. But alright, starting off strong, I'm liking where this is going. What have we got next? So for some reason the Fine Bruce decided they wanted to make a movie. You know, the guys behind such acclaimed pieces like Kids React and Teens React and uh, Adults React. Here we have F The Prom, a movie revolving around high school popularity how it relates to social media, and just how horrible teenagers can be. How unique. Right off the bat, this film shattered any expectations of being in any ways good. Stop trying to peek at Maddie's nipples. Oh my god, dad! Nice delayed reaction, I sure hope that nice shot was worth it, brothers. Before I get into what this film is even about, it's just a complete drab to look at. It's so dull and muted, this color grading is genuinely horrendous. Our movie is serious and grounded, so we've got to make everything look ultra-realistic. This film is about Maddie and her best friend Cole. Maddie is super popular, but Cole is uber lame. After her boyfriend cheats on her with her best friend, Maddie decides that she wants to ruin the prom for everyone. 
So her and Cole gather a team of social rejects to devise a highly complex plan to destroy the prom. By pouring paint on someone and setting off the fire alarm. I am. Um, I, I don't think you need the team for that, you just need to pull a switch. So Benny and Rafi Fine are trying to tell a somewhat grounded story about popularity and how social media consumes high school students. Despite them being like 40 years old and not having social media while at high school, I think they'd be better off telling a story about high school kids playing with a stick and wheel. It immediately hits you in the face of how quote unquote hip it is with modern trends. The credits are filled with emojis. Characters are constantly spouting phrases like, You're a selfie virgin? And, You mad bro? How did Fred the movie have less cringy dialogue than this? Is this really how teenagers act? Did they just say, we film teenagers all the time, we know how they react to stuff, let's make a movie, how hard can it be? It doesn't help that this movie is trying way too hard to be funny. You know, it's one of those films where they feel they need to make every character the comic relief. We can't just have a normal principal, she needs to act like a kid and be real crazy. A regular teacher who just teaches? Why have that when she can be a wacky teacher who's obsessed with her phone and is played by a Lily Singh? Did you guys see Maddie's eyebrows from last weekend? Oh, on fleek. This might be able to work in a film that's only goal is to make you laugh like in I don't have to bring it up all the time but Fred the movie. Unlike that they're trying to tell a genuine story here. All these comic relief characters really clash and conflict with the tone they're trying to go for. And even then they don't succeed when they do try to focus on their targeted tone. The whole message behind the movie I think is to not care about what other people think of you and do whatever you want to do. Like a whole let's all gather together, hold hands and sing kumbaya because we're all equal on the inside. But this message is shown through one of the most unlikable characters I've ever had the displeasure of watching in a movie. She is so unbelievably shallow. So get this. She starts to ignore her best friend Cole when they first enter high school to protect her image. Then when one single bad thing happens to her, she has a complete turnaround and starts hanging out with Cole and the losers. Because now she wants to get back at the society that so coldly rejected her. Society, right? Then when her ex-boyfriend gets jealous and wants her back, she immediately jumps on that leaving the rest of them to go ahead with their plan despite her being the one who instigated it. When they finally do their plan and pour paint on her, she suddenly starts going, Oh, why did you have to ruin the prom just because you're such a loser? This was supposed to be my night. Words cannot describe how much I despise this character. Does that make me hypocrite? Yes. Yes, it does. So yeah, F the Prom is a movie about despicable characters being despicable. Isn't that fun to watch? Well no, I'm not even going to play along with that sarcastic remark. It's not fun to watch. It is such a slog to sit through, it feels like it's going on for an eternity. It's just scene after scene of flip-flopping between whether or not she wants to go to the prom, and then they have the nerve to drag it out with pointless segments. There's like a 20 minute montage introducing the members of their epic prom heist, each given their own little backstory as to why we're supposed to care about them like it's frickin' Suicide Squad. But half of them barely even do anything, I really don't know why we needed so many characters. Alright, I've run out of things to say about F the Prom, there's almost nothing to it. Bad direction, bad characters, bad audio mixing, and worst of all, bad dialogue. You mad bro? I can't really say I'm surprised considering it was made by the people who had the genius idea to trademark the word react, but it is what it is. And what it is is terrible. I can only pray that whatever we've got up next is at least the slightest bit more watchable. Smosh the movie is so unbelievably bad I cannot fathom it. I was so excited for this film as a kid. I thought the trailers made it out to be great and then, well, I never watched it. Ian Hecox and Anthony Padilla were just two friends who sat in front of a camera and sang over theme songs, with their biggest hit being the Pokemon one. They eventually started to skyrocket in popularity, making skits about whatever random thing they could think of. At one point, the channel even became the most popular thing on the entirety of YouTube, and they expanded their show to have entire professional sets, casts, some of which were even on Disney Channel and Nickelodeon sitcoms. You know, the realest of actors. So it isn't surprising the duo would try their hand at a feature. He co-wrote the book with his special friend, I, Ian Paykix. He cocks. Thanks for having so us. So in this book. Now, surprisingly, this isn't even the first Smosh movie. Sorta. In 2014, they uploaded what I guess could be considered a film. It was a one-hour special written and directed by the two themselves. It's nothing amazing, but the premise is kind of amusing. Setting up this super serious, action-packed adventure only to have the entire film be Ian and Anthony mundanely walking to the bad guy's hideout. I guess what I'm trying to get at here is this one-hour special uploaded for free on their YouTube channel feels more like a movie than this half-baked Disney Channel sitcom. What was also surprising, I was so shocked to find out how little involvement Ian and Anthony actually had in this. They didn't write, direct, produce, 
They basically just starred in it and that was all. Why was this made? Well, of course, other than that reason. I know modern Smosh gets barely featured or even written by the two. I mean, Anthony literally left the entirety of Smosh a few years back. But you'd think for their first feature film, they'd at least want to have some input. The movie starts with this truly abysmal animated opening. I see a lot of people comment on this when talking about the movie, but did you know there is actually a full series with this animation on the Shut Up Cartoons channel? I religiously watched this as a kid. On there, you can watch such amazing Smosh originals as... Smosh Babies and Super Smosh. They ought to start their own streaming service, I tell you what. So Smosh the movie is about Ian and Anthony. After graduating high school, their lives have pretty much gone nowhere, with Anthony working a dead-end food delivery job and Ian still living at home with his parents. After finding out there's going to be a high school reunion, Anthony thinks this is the perfect opportunity to turn his life around by confessing his love for his crush. It's just too bad that somebody uploaded an embarrassing video of Anthony singing the Pokemon theme song. Get it? It's like a reference. And then having a microphone shoved up his... Yeah, anyone want to explain to me how the mic managed to pull down Anthony's little panties and go up his- Okay, that's enough, okay? Yeah, okay, you get the picture. So Ian and Anthony are tasked with going inside of YouTube to change the video from within. Dumb. I need a video removed and never shown on your website ever again. Okay, are you a rich and powerful corporation that can threaten us with legal action? No. Then I can't help you, goodbye. Okay, movie, I'll give you that. That is extremely accurate. I don't care if your comedy movie has a stupid premise, but at least have it make sense within the universe the film establishes. We later find out it was actually Ian who filmed and uploaded the video. So why didn't he just delete it? They imply they have to go inside of YouTube to change it because what goes on the internet stays there forever. But the video had like 300 views and nobody in Anthony's life really remembered it. So why didn't Ian just delete it so we didn't have to watch this god awful movie? So okay, I'm sorry, this seemed like really nice guys, but they're just so bad at acting. When you have little amateur skits uploaded for free on YouTube, you can overlook certain things like low production values, acting. But when you have a feature length film, you expect people to pay for an actual movie. So those same factors aren't as excusable. Anthony just seems so unsure of himself with every line. And while Ian is a little better, he says every single line with the exact same tone and inflection. But hey, don't pay attention to that. Look, it's Markiplier. Don't pay attention to the atrocious CG gorilla in green screen because there's Markiplier. You know him. I think the only reason they made this story revolve around YouTube is because, well, A, a Smosh movie is creatively bankrupt from the start, but more importantly, B, it allows them to do the movie equivalent of dangling keys in front of their audience by inserting all these pointless, gratuitous YouTuber cameos. We get to see such famous e-celebrities as Redacted and Redacted. Oh my god, that one's my favorite. This movie tries to be like one of those adventure buddy comedies, where each scene is more so an excuse to have the two comedically play off whatever is going on, but I swear to god, it's like they forgot to go back and add in jokes. Okay, so Anthony goes to a furry video, I guess, and looks uncomfortable. Then he leaves. What is the joke? Is it that furries are weird? You're not wrong, but... You, you gotta do something. The worst part is it's not even entertainingly bad. If when watching this movie with a group of friends we're all just sitting there watching your comedy movie in complete silence, it either means one of two things. We're really invested in Ian and Anthony getting out of YouTube, or we're bored. I'm gonna let you guess which of the two we were feeling. The Smosh movie was shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <I think> <laughs> Overall, this might be the worst one yet. At least after the prom looked and felt like a movie. Just because you can keep people's attention for 5 minute skits doesn't mean just doing the exact same thing for 90 minutes is equally gonna hold that attention. They should be like... Embarrassed to put their name on this. And it appears that at least Anthony is. I wonder why. My name's Brad. What the fuck? <laughs> Transphobia. How comedic. A real knee slapper if I do say so myself. Let's just hope the next isn't as offensive. Uh-oh. This timing could not be any more unfortunate. I swear it wasn't intentional. I don't want to talk too much about the drama machine has recently got himself into, but let's just say that looking back, he probably regrets a lot of the jokes in this film. I was initially hopeful as this movie was produced by the same person as American Pie, which is like... which is like a real movie. But don't worry, that hope was quickly shattered. Why is he looking at that pie all funny? Oh my god! Oh no, he didn't! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you fool! <laughs> to be fair, Shane wasn't the writer of this film, but he did direct it, meaning he had some kind of input in how things were shown. Not cool is about how Shane Dawson is so incredibly hot and epic, and everyone wants to bone him. 
There are scenes in this movie where characters will just stop to discuss how great looking Sheehan is. Oh my god, you know you're attractive, it's annoying. Okay, so this is the part where you like, tell me that you really, really, really want to bone me. When they're not doing that, we're seeing the perspective of three other main characters. Sheehan's sister is getting stalked and harassed by this weird guy who is written as a guest stereotype, yet that doesn't seem to be intentional at all. Except instead of showing this from the girl's perspective, we're supposed to relate and sympathize with the creep. Nothing even ends up happening in the end, as no matter what he does, she still isn't attracted to him, and instead helps him get led by some of her desperate friends. If his only goal was to get led, then why did he fixate on her so much? Why did we spend half a movie building up to this weak payoff? When we're not watching that exciting romp, we're getting to know our other, other, other main character. This edgy emo girl who was bullied by Sheehan in high school. But now not even she can resist how unbelievably hot that fringe is. So instead of having what the professionals in the industry call a... Plot? This is more of a character study showing the gradual bond between she and an emo girl. I actually wouldn't have minded this film that much if it stuck to that and tried to do it earnestly. But instead, it's also insistent on being a rip-roaring, hysterical teen comedy film with tons of alcohol, drugs, and partying. Where the main source of comedy is... Haha, <laughs> that person is different from me! How unfortunate is it that they can't be like she and Dawson? I mean, we got jokes about everyone here, folks. Homeless people, the mentally handicapped, the physically handicapped. And it wouldn't be a real Sheen Dawson production without those totally tubular racial jokes. Oh, I know! Some motherfucker was so disgusting. Again, the timing on this couldn't be worse. <laughs> Who am I kidding? It couldn't be better. The party scene showed the humor at its worst. It's just so loud and obnoxious. Like, okay, I grew up in the UK and my only exposure to American culture is through dumb high school comedies. Is it really like this? Are these movies at all accurate to how high school is over there? Because if it is, you're horrible. This movie just sort of toddles along with nothing much happening. There were like 20 minutes left and we still didn't get to the obvious part where they needlessly break up for a few scenes and immediately get back together. So then they force this conflict where emo girl is annoyed because Sheen basically has no direction in life. But then she is told she needs to stop trying to change people so much. But like, no, she's right. He literally suggested living in the back of his car. Also, to comment on Sheen for a second, he actually isn't a bad leading man. He is not a bad actor at all. It's just a shame that he's horribly miscast in his own film. He's portrayed as this cool hunk who all the girls and boys pine for. But if you look at him, he's just this scrawny little kid with a Justin Bieber haircut. I've noticed all these high school comedies have that one part where they try to have a sincere moment then follow it up by going, Oh my god, that is so cliche. As if acknowledging how predictable your movie is somehow makes it better. <sighs> Scott, enough. This is way too Disney Channel. Yeah, I don't care. If anything, it makes it worse. You know what you're making is bad, yet you're gonna do it anyway in some vain attempt to be quirky and self-referential. So yeah, not cool. I mean, it's accurate. <laughs> not cool as Sheen Dawson film might be the lowest ranked one out of all these. For the most part, it's really boring scenes of characters you don't care about discussing how bad their lives are. And after about, I don't know, 12.4 seconds of that, you just want to see them go back to the pointless B story of Stalker Boy being a stalker. I'd be able to pass it off as a forgettable romance film, but what really brings it down is the awful humor. That entirely relies on you thinking offensive jokes equals funny. But I could forgive all that. Well, not the racist stuff, but I could forgive most of that. Here's the worst part that set the film over the edge for me. I spent money on this. I had to go to my Amazon and actually pay for this film, since there were so little people seeing it on my totally legit movie downloading site. And because of that, I hereby crown Not Cool the worst out of all of them. So far. Out of all these films, this was the one I was most curious to finally see. How could a movie written and produced by the Paul brothers be anything other than a complete train wreck? Or should I say, plea and wreck. <laughs> this film was initially to release in 2017, but after Logan got himself in a small controversy, it was pushed back all the way to 2019. I tried looking up reviews to see what people thought and this is all I could find. Airplane Mode only has one professional review, which was negative. And although it was widely panned by YouTube commentary channels, it was actually praised by Paul himself. You don't say. Airplane Mode has quite a simple concept. It's a parody of the 1980 film Airplane. Logan and his group of social media influencer friends are flying to Australia for Hashtagacon. And Logan also wants to meet his online girlfriend despite being this buff chad. Somehow him not being able to get a local girlfriend is the most unrealistic thing about this film. When they all get in the plane, their collective obnoxiousity, it's a new word I'm coining for these people, ends up killing the pilots and now Logan Paul is tasked with landing a plea. Wait a minute. 
Is that the guy from Fred the Movie? You've got quite the resume, my good man. The best thing I can say about airplane mode is that it knows what it is. The film mostly relies on you knowing how these influencers act and finding that in and of itself funny, like a channel lost a movie with a budget. But since I know of nobody except for Logan, and unfortunately Lele Pons, I was mostly confused while watching. That really is only the beginning though. Once they get in the play and it gets a fair bit better, I actually find myself laughing a couple times during the film, mostly at the absurdity of it all. What about your real brother, Jake? Oh. <laughs> Disney got him. Don't get me wrong, that's not said's good. I think by now long viewers of my channel can tell of my affection for really dumb humor. This movie almost feels like a live action family guy at times. And I'm not saying it's a laugh a minute kind of thing. The jokes are mostly just head scratching moments. Especially the references to things like leave Britney alone. Even if this movie came out in 2017 like it was originally planned, that still would have been about a decade too late. <laughs> I also appreciate that it doesn't do what a lot of these YouTuber movies do and puts the creator up on a pedestal. There are a lot of jokes at the expense of Logan and his friends, who are mostly shown to be annoying personality-less influencers. Which might I say this movie is filled with? Almost every single character is played by another e-celebrity. So much so that I started to question if this were all just one big scam for Logan to give himself and his friends giant paychecks. This movie isn't great. Again, it's mostly boring. It's quite telling when most of these movies show how much these creators struggle when making something above the average YouTube video length. But airplane mode isn't as bad as I thought it'd be. I could see younger kids looking back on this movie the same way I look back on Fred. Acknowledging it's not that good, but rather being able to appreciate it as a relic of its time. But for me at least, this movie is mostly a harmless film that should have been put up for free on YouTube. And there we have it. If I were to give all these films a ranking in order from worst to best, it'd probably go something like Not Cool, Smosh the Movie, F the Prom, Airplane Mode, and finally, Fred the Movie, Stay as the Victor. I wouldn't call a single one of these films good, but it's quite noble that a lot of these guys felt like making something bigger and better to their norm. I can at least say most of them tried with their films, but maybe at a certain point you should just realize your limits and stick with what you know. But maybe some channels like Fine Bros or Sheen Dot- okay, well maybe not him- will try to improve upon their first attempt to make an actual quality piece of entertainment. Now if you'll excuse me, I've gotta get back to filming my totally original YouTuber movie. Okay, action! Shut, Stacy! I can't believe you cheat on me with Brad! Oh my god, Chad, please don't go to prom with me. Aw oh yeah, here I come, Oscars.